The paper I've been writing is called From Informal to Intentional. What can the waste pickers of Jakarta learn from intentional communities like the one we're in now? Um, but I guess my thinking is that this could apply to lots of different informal sector communities. Um, yeah, the two places I've been writing about couldn't really be more different. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to find a photo to demonstrate sustainable living and I was going to get one of the living machine or the kitchen but when we took this photo this captured the feeling of Findhorn for me. This is our group who's been the, the, the Taste of Findhorn experience. So we, you know, we're all straight, uh, strangers at the start with and we're kind of sharing the space together but over three days we've really created a strong bond and formed a little community. Um, but this didn't just happen by accident. The, the process we've been through and the physical infrastructure that we've been interacting with and the social technology we've, we've been using, such as the transformation game and the attunements, really helped bring us together. And that's <coughs> something I've been uh, blown away by, really. Uh, I think we've all had a pretty epic time so far. Um, and I've speaking to people that live in Fintorn that have been here for a long time and short time, it seems that there's quite a diverse range of different lifestyles that could be supported here, so people can kind of define things in their own terms. And it seems, um, seems to be working, seems to be a success. On the other hand, we've got Jakarta. And this place is a bit of a mess. The infrastructure is buckling under rapid uh, urbanisation and huge population growth, and it's just not handling it. So one of the things I was thinking is how can we transform some of the systems that are in places like Fintorn and move it to somewhere like this. So it's an ambitious idea. I went over there in December to look for waste and to try and find waste workers. And as soon as you get there, the impacts of waste are immediately obvious. A lot of the stuff ends up in the canals and the rivers, and it impacts the ability of the infrastructure to handle the water. So, you know, it rains a lot in the wet season, and it just floods like mad. Every time it rains, the drains just fill up straight away. And we end up with this kind of thing. So when I was talking to the people that live on the informal settlements, they basically stop rebuilding the whole first floor and there's all these ropes up the top where they pull themselves along when it gets that bad. So these guys need a lot of social capital to keep resilience and to keep going in these kind of conditions. Obviously, the groundwater's not too good. Not only have we got the waste, but there's a lot of industrial pollution and... Yeah, it's just not very good. You can't drink it anymore and I've found that one out the hard way. Um, and the people that live there are a bit tougher than me, but it's still not optimal by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think before I went there, it's quite easy to think of yourself as you know the average man in the street, and for someone like that, it's hard to see what's really so bad about it. But as soon as you get somewhere like this, you realise what well, like, this isn't average at all. It's you know, there's a lot of people that live in these kind of places. And it was a bit scary, to be honest. Uh, it, was uh, it was shocking. It was the first time I've been anywhere this kind of poorly organised. Um, and yet 70% of humans are going to be living in urban centres by 2050. Most of them will be poor or lower working class. So average life for the next generation is probably going to be a struggle unless something significant happens soon. About 20 years ago, um, perceived employment opportunities drew a lot of people in from rural areas into places like Jakarta. But then at the end of the 90s, there was that big crash and fortunes changed. And a lot of people fell back onto informal work, such as waste. It provides a financial lifeline. And informal work's unregulated, illegal. But it's actually essential to keep somewhere like Jakarta running. It wouldn't keep going otherwise. So... Over here, we've got people that live off the grid by choice to get an alternative, sustainable life. Over here, they're kind of forced to the fringes because the economy doesn't place much value on them. So we've got very different circumstances, but underneath, the same, we've got the same sorts of people with the same needs to feed their families and have meaningful, safe work. 
and to grow old with some dignity. So that's kind of why I started asking this question, how can we transfer the Findhorn model somewhere like Jakarta? Um, so I haven't really got that far in answering this question yet because it's the first time I've been to an intentional community. So I'm kind of using this opportunity to put a shout out there to try and gain some first-hand insights you know, you know, in the Q&A or afterwards to try and help me complete my paper. But <laughs> I'll, um, what I want to talk a bit more about is the motivation behind writing it and I'm going to discuss a few ideas that I've been thinking about in my PhD project and I want to talk about the relationship between zero waste and intent and then I'll go on to shared themes and I've just put that last one in there this morning because I was feeling brave but if I've got time I'll go into that one. So. Um, I'm studying at a place called the Zero Waste SA Research Centre for Sustainable Design and Behaviour, which is a mouthful. And we get a lot of people from industry telling us that zero waste is impossible. And we shouldn't discourage people having incinerators, because exactly, it's practical, you can get waste to energy. And in, our, in the, one of the books that came out of our research centre, my supervisors um, felt it necessary to even de defend against the utopian uh, you know, label that zero waste has got, but we had a conversation last night, and you know, it's a shame that utopia has been related to unrealistic. And you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a vision and kind of reaching, reaching, you know, for something decent. So I actually do think zero waste is achievable, and I think it's an essential part of building sustainable communities. Uh, it really just depends on what we mean <coughs> by waste and how we define zero waste. So I'll go into that now. Um, waste doesn't just get created when we chuck something in the bin or someone's thrown it out the window or it goes to landfill. Waste is from a whole chain of events, back to retailing, manufacture, the whole design. So I think if we want to start tackling the waste problem, we need to go to the origins of why all this stuff's getting created. Um, I've seen zero waste described as 100% diversion from landfill, but that's not even enough with more people all the time. Recycling takes energy, it's got to get to recycling centres. So we need to be looking at ways to avoid waste. So you know, everyone here is doing recycling and reusing, there's infrastructure to do it. But to avoid waste on a bigger scale we need to really start thinking about what we're trying to achieve. And it's about dropping habits that aren't serving us and innovating <coughs> products that are kind of suboptimal. So, it's not always that easy for a consumer to know the waste, the impact of the waste with the things they're buying. Both these apples would have the same use value, but if one came from the back garden and the other one came from overseas where it had been shipped over here, refrigerated, lots of fertiliser, there's a very real consequence in which choice the consumer's making. And... It's, yeah, it's not always that easy to see, so part of the work I'm doing is trying to find better ways of measuring waste and detecting waste. <coughs> if we times this by all the apples we eat and all the different products this applies to, it really adds up. Um, so I came along this quote early on when I was writing my research proposal. This is from my supervisor. So he said, waste is a misallocated resource. And I read this quite a few times and really ran with it. And I started to think that Waste isn't just the material stuff that comes out of our activity. There's other resources that we waste. And we say things like this all the time, a waste of time, effort, energy, social capital, and even things like trust and goodwill can get wasted. So <coughs> waste is really about compromise in, in what we're doing and it shows us what our priorities really are and you have to start asking if we're trying to accumulate the right resources. Another important idea that I came across is that waste is the absence of value and when I started thinking about this I started writing that waste is really a subjective notion, it's a description rather than an actual thing in itself. So. Depending on who you are, you can see the same item or the same activity, and it could either be a waste or a resource. So I think getting to zero waste is going to be a matter of perception and intent as much as a technical fix. Having said that, 
in developed places like Adelaide and I'm sure over here, a lot of the waste reduction efforts uh, concentrate on behaviour change and attitude change without really appreciating that we're often compelled to do things to behave in a certain way by the built environment and the social structures that we're a part of. For example, when housing developers cheap out on materials and design, the occupants for the next 50 or 60 years are stuck with a product that's creating waste on an ongoing basis. So someone saves some money, but everyone else is wasting, wasting their time. So we end up having to go out, work more, travel more, consume more, and persuade everyone else to consume more to pay off waste that needn't have been there in the first place. Same goes for in Jakarta. This is kind of typical in the Kampung areas. The, the, the people that live there get their waste, throw it through a hole like this, and then it ends up rolling down into the river. I'm sure a while ago they did this and it wasn't a problem when it was all organic, but now the composition's changed, this is a major problem. Um, but they're not doing this because they don't care or they're you know, too thick to realise what's happening. They're doing it because they haven't got any bins and they can't afford anyone to come and pick it up. So waste management's not top of the pops in their situation. And so we've got to ask ourselves why we're building the environment, why we're building our cities like this, why are our jobs so wasteful and our houses and uh, products and services. And I think when the real purpose behind these things is financially motivated, we're bound to find compromises in design that cause the users to waste their resources. And this just keeps having a knock-on effect. So <coughs> I actually think a lot of the avoidable waste is resulted from a mismatch between, of intent between the maker of the products and the services and the users. And this is why I got thinking about intentional communities as a good model for a zero waste lifestyle because all the stakeholders know their equipment, they know their environment and they're all moving in the same direction so there's less uh, conflict in that respect. Um, this is a quote that I found while I was writing the paper and I, I really liked it. It says intentional communities are conceived of the seeds of a new social order and from what I've read and what I've experienced so far, it seems like establishing an intentional community or joining one is about kind of taking ownership of the direction your life's going, and taking responsibility of stewardship for a particular place. And that's another reason why I think this could be really relevant for the problem of urban, urban poverty in the future. So, yeah, if we ask ourselves why somewhere like Findorn's a success, um, in another project, I came across a definition of success, and it says the progressive realisation of a worthy goal. And I think that's what we see here. Um, I don't think the goal's been achieved in, in the big vision, but everyone here seems to have a coherence of intent. And they've created a momentum that's now got a life of its own. And I think this kind of collective momentum is one of the most powerful energy forces we can harness, and it could be for good or bad. So we need to kind of make sure this is spreading. On the opposite side, um, Jakarta's got no coherence between the stakeholders and the actors in the city. Um, so to demonstrate this, I'll just tell you a story about how waste gets collected and where the frustrations arise. Um, when I was over there, I was quite lucky because I, I was talking to the guy that owns the hostel and he was interested in my project. And he said he knew where some of the waste guys that pick his rubbish hang out. So we went down there on his moped and... Uh, started to try and engage them in conversation. Uh, I think they're a little bit perplexed at the start with an English guy taking pictures of cardboard and bags of bottles, but in the end we sat down with him and started talking. And uh, yeah, well, I wasn't talking, I didn't understand them, but Dave could translate and we found, found out a bit about their day to day activities. So if you're lucky enough to be a homeowner in Jakarta, you pay like a facilities manager for the block to handle <coughs> cleaning the drains, uh, dealing with security and waste collection. And this is all informal work. So the facilities manager will negotiate with some guys like you've just seen or their boss a price to take care of the waste. But again, it's all informal work, so they've got no real rights or protection in this. Uh, like Rule number one for zero waste is separating wet and dry. 
because otherwise it's disgusting and all the other material is contaminated. But the homeowners don't really have any incentive to do that, so you know the waste guys just have to pick it up nonetheless. They stick it on their carts, and these are pretty heavy, and it's hot, and it's smelly. And they take them back to their transfer station where they're based, and then they try and sort it through and get anything of value. But stuff like plastic bags, they leave, and then that goes to the dump, and then the waste pickers get that. But they'll pick out big bits of cardboard, wood, you know, stuff they, stuff they can uh, get some value from. And then it's here in the local transfer station where the government takes over and it becomes formal. So they load all this stuff on a truck, and then it moves and gets instantly stuck in traffic because there's a constant traffic jam in Jakarta. So this is a you know, really inefficient way of dealing with the problem. And it goes to, there's one major landfill that's been full up a long time and it's unsanitary, so it all leaches into the groundwater and that's where the waste pickers live. So the best approach would be a lot more recycling at the source, decentralised, and everyone playing their part and doing the things like we do down in the kitchen and everywhere has got a separate place to go. And during my research I've seen some good examples of this in Sao Paulo where the government went to a centralised privatised solution but it didn't work because all of a sudden all these people haven't got a financial lifeline anymore so they solved one problem but created you know, a million more problems. So luckily they had the vision and there was researchers to help try it out with some action research to invest in the waste workers um, and it's just small things like a space to keep the valuable resources, gloves, boots and even a logo so they've got some sort of status and then the householders don't need to be so intimidated by these guys. They can sort of realise what their role needs to do and they can see the advantages so that's worked quite well. But uh, I don't know if the Jakarta government's going to go for this. They've got a bit of a history of big ticket centralised items like uh, incinerators. So if the government don't buy into that, I'm suggesting that these guys kind of go it alone and start forming um, intentional communities or collectives. Two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah, sound. Um, so these are the shared themes that came up. Um, while I was writing the paper, but I'll just talk about education because it seems appropriate. Also got to talk to these guys, the Chiliwang Institute. And these are local activists who teach the community about how to look after the river and raise awareness about people that, aren't, uh, that are polluting the river. They lure the kids down with games and colouring in books and the computer and then they can teach, teach them the message and then they can use pester power to try and influence their parents. So I think that's a good approach. <laughs> they also use uh, social media. Indonesia's got the largest Twitter base in the world, surprisingly. And everywhere you go, people have got smartphones. So again, I think this is good, but they're not that popular. Um, so this is kind of one of the other ideas that I was thinking, how can Fintorn really help people like this? And I think it has to go online, really. They need to teach these people how to be better activists and better leaders. We don't need to go over there and do it ourselves. They've got, the, they've got the inspiration to do it themselves, but I just think they need a bit of a help really figuring out how to do it. And this is an outcome of a project. Um, I think what we need is a platform, like a Kickstarter platform, where these community groups can put online a project. They can show us what the benefits are in terms of avoiding waste. And then anyone that's got experience in something similar can put a comment or contribute you know, a resource like these books, say you guys need to read this. And then we end up getting a database of very different possible solutions depending on, the, you know, everyone's got similar problems. So kind of create this collection of solutions there. And also this could um, you know, be used as a platform for voting, decision making and crowdsourcing resources. So, that's one thing I want to get out of my PhD is try and design some software like this and try it out in this particular instance. And that is the end. Light at the end of the tunnel. So there you go. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, hi mate. <coughs> It seems to me that there is one um, zero waste system, and that is the ecosystem. 
and if we could imitate that um, in, the, in, in our manufacturing systems by using closed loop systems where every piece of the process from, from uh, the input to the output returns and goes in a circle, um, we would have a zero waste economic system. Mm. But uh, the, uh, because in the ecosystem, uh, everything that dies goes back into the soil eventually and creates new life. Mm. Um, uh, don't, don't we need something of that sort? I completely agree. Um, one of the reasons I got into this community reading is because I've realised that localisation is going to be so important. Uh, produce needs locally, I think it just makes a lot of sense. The problem is if you want to have some sort of IT network like we were talking about earlier, you, it's hard to localise because all the stuff's made in China and very far away. So this is kind of like the problem we have with e-waste. They're trying to get it going in Adelaide, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to dismantle it in Adelaide, then you've still got to ship all the stuff back over there anyway. Um, with the best intentions, they've banned the export of e-waste because we were doing it dodgily. We were sending it over there and not providing them with any equipment, so people were you know, burning the, the circuit boards and then just chucking everything in, in their fields and it was creating lots of problems. So I think either we bring electronics production to kind of regional scales somehow or yeah, we need to design this kind of closed loop into the electronics industry. But for food and clothing and building materials, it makes total sense to kind of use organic stuff locally. Did you have a question, mate? Yeah. Um, I lived for a while in Southeast Asia, and one thing that impressed me at the time was the fact that they packaged all of their stuff in banana leaves and other completely 100% biodegradable uh, packaging. And during the time I was there, I was there for several years, they introduced plastic bags in the same area. And what people would do is they would just drop them out the window of whatever vehicle they were traveling in or while they were walking along the road because they presumed that this plastic stuff, which was modern, being introduced to modernization was going to biodegrade. Fortunately, it takes about 20 years for plastic bags to biodegrade. But what links us with Jakarta and what links us with places like Laos who are just moving into the package industry is the, is the idea of informed choices, I think, which is why I find your platform idea really, really fascinating because you can say link, yes, link Finform to uh, Jakarta because the most important thing is that people are motivated mm that they get the information and they're motivated to really change their behavior. Because I know, and certainly in my circles, that people are informed, but the problem is that they don't think it matters what you do as an individual. As soon as we start believing it really makes a difference what we do individually, that thousands of individuals are going to change their habits in terms of waste, because you're talking about getting to zero waste. Mm. And I think the only way we can do it, and that we can link it up to the whole bigger picture in the big system of industries, we start demanding uh, zero packaging, that we leave all our packaging at the supermarket and we buy stuff, and we bring along our own um, cups and our own um, milk bottles to get the stuff filled up. And I think that's the only way that's going to change. So if we manage to get people communicating and sharing their knowledge, their local knowledge, uh, right across the world, it's very motivating <coughs> to actually make individual behavioral change. And that was more of a, a common <coughs> question, but I don't know what you think about that. Um, well, my response would be to completely agree with you about the packaging change. Um, and my friend went to Samoa as well, and she said the same thing was happening there. People are just so used to you know, letting it degrade and it being a, a resource or nourishment that I think it's hard to kind of break out of that routine. But at the same time, you'd think you'd notice if it wasn't going anywhere. So I think there's an infrastructure problem as well that... You know, it is hard to keep carrying stuff around. Sooner or later, you've got to get, get rid of it. Um, and, yeah, with the platform, I think uh, like it felt a bit hopeless over there, to be honest. It's kind of messy everywhere. And I think if you had some good examples that had an investment in it, that could be an incubator for, for other people to think, oh, these guys are doing it. Why aren't we doing it? So I think you need these kind of working demonstrations and hubs in all these different areas to kind of inspire people. So yeah, that's a good point.
I just have a few thoughts on you know you said you want more yep. material. <laughs> so. um, well, one thing is that we've just taken online what we call the solution library. Oh wow! It's very connected yeah. in a way to this platform. And one of the important things is that the solutions come from all over the world. They don't just come from. I think what's really important is not to take a stance where the solutions come from Fintor to Jakarta. No. Because that will never work. It's yeah. about empowerment. So it's about what can we learn from them and how can we step into a really fruitful exchange. So I think it would be interesting to link you up to the solution library because we want to have a whole corner on waste. Okay. And especially like we've been. From the African networks, we've been collecting some of the examples of recycle, recycling art, you know, mm. how to make good handicrafts. And all of that, you know, it all needs to be linked up. Yeah. Another part that I'm thinking of is the biometrix um, that is functioning here from Fintorn and is cleaning up waterways, for instance, in Manila, yeah. in a big way. So cleaning the rivers with um, biomimicry methods, really bringing together technology and the intelligence of nature. And then um, having that with local waterway police, which are youth that have a specific uniform. So very similar to what you were speaking about in Sao Paulo. And I think it would be great if a link like that could be made with Jakarta as well as, as Biomatrix grows. So, and then another, just another, you know, that when you said, you know, experience of this just, in my experience of working with people who've worked a long time in slums in different areas of the world, at some point people who do that work for a long time tend to come to the same question, which is why are the people moving into the cities? Why are they mm. moving into the slums? Because it's usually because something in rural areas isn't working anymore. It's because their lands are appropriated, their waters are polluted. But there's something at the moment, especially as internet comes in, and we don't need to move to cities anymore to connect up the global culture. Well, I think that point of both linking back to the traditional wisdom that these people used to have, usually it's just one at the most two generations ago <coughs> that they used to have in the traditional villages, but also linking back and seeing where are they coming from, why are they coming from, how can we support youth especially to reconnect to their origin and to heal, mm. to heal something there, which is, as you say, you know, looking at the origin and the waste, but also looking at the origin of the human migration. Mm. Yeah. No, that's important. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much to all our speakers. We've run out of time, so good morning.